Okay, sleeper and the spindle, part two. Sometimes a dwarf would yawn and stumble. Each time the other dwarfs would take him by the arms and march him forwards, struggling and muttering until his mind returned. The queen stayed awake. Although the forest was filled with people she knew could not be there. They walked beside her on the path. Sometimes they spoke to her. Let us now discuss how diplomacy is affected by matters of natural philosophy, said her father. My sisters ruled the world, said her stepmother, dragging her iron shoes along the forest path. They glowed a dull orange, yet none of the dry leaves burned where the shoes touched them. The mortal folk rose up against us. They cast us down. And as we waited in crevices, in places they do not see us, and now they adore me. Even you, my stepdaughter, even you adore me. You are so beautiful said her mother, who had died so very long ago, like a crimson rose in the fallen snow. Sometimes wolves ran beside them, pounding dust and leaves up from the forest floor, although the passage of the wolves did not disturb the huge cobwebs that hung like veils across the path. Also, sometimes the wolves ran through the trunks of trees and off into the darkness. The queen liked the wolves and was sad when one of the dwarfs began shouting, saying that the spiders were bigger than pigs and wolves would vanish from her head and from the world. It was not so. They were only spiders of a regular size, used to spinning their webs undisturbed by time and by travelers. The drawbridge across the moat was down and they crossed it although everything seemed to be pushing them away. They could not enter the castle, however. Thick thorns filled the gateway and fresh growth was covered with roses. The queen saw the remains of men in the thorns, skeletons in armor and skeletons unarmored. Some of the skeletons were high on the sides of the castle and the queen wondered if they had climbed up seeking an entry and died there or if they had died on the ground and been carried upwards as the roses grew. She came to no conclusions. Either way was possible. And then her world was warm and comfortable and she became certain that closing her eyes for only a handful of moments would not be harmful. Who would mind? No one. Help me, croaked the queen. The dwarf with the brown beard pulled a thorn from the rose bush nearest to him and jabbed it hard into the queen's thumb and pulled it out again. A drop of deep blood dripped onto the flagstones of the gateway. Ow, said the queen, and then, thank you. They stared at the thick barrier of thorns, the dwarfs and the queen. She reached out and picked a rose from the thorn creeper nearest her and bound it into her hair. We could tunnel our way in, said the dwarfs. Go under the moat and into the foundations and up. Only take us a couple of days. The queen pondered. Her thumb hurt and she was pleased her thumb hurt. She said, this began here 80 or so years ago. It began slowly. It only spread recently. It is spreading faster and faster. We do not know if the sleepers can ever wake. We do not know anything, save that we may not actually have 
another two days. She eyed the dense tangle of thorns, living and dead, decades of dried dead plants, their thorns as sharp in death as ever they were when alive. She walked along the wall until she reached a skeleton, and she pulled the rotted cloth from its shoulders and felt it as she did so. It was dry, yes. It would make good kindling. Who has the tinderbox? she asked. The old, th the old thorns burned so hot and so fast. In 15 minutes, orange flames snaked upwards. They seemed, for a moment, to engulf the building, and then they were gone, leaving just blackened stone. The remaining thorns, though strong enough to have withstood the heat, were easily cut through by the queen's sword and were hauled away and tossed into the moat. The four travelers went into the castle. The old woman peered out of the slitted window at the flames below her. Smoke drifted in through the window, but neither the flames nor the roses reached the highest tower. She knew that the castle was being attacked, and she would have hidden in the tower room had there been anywhere to hide had the sleeper not been on the bed. She swore and began laboriously to walk down the steps one at a time. She intended to make it down as far as the castle's battlements from where she could reach the far side of the building, the cellars. She could hide there. She knew the building better than anybody. She was slow, but she was cunning and she could wait. Oh, she could wait. She heard their calls rising up the stairwell this way, up here. It feels worse this way. Come on, quickly. She turned around then, did her best to hurry upwards, but her legs moved no faster than they had when she was climbing earlier that day. They caught her just as she reached the top of the steps. Three men, no higher than her hips, closely followed by a young woman in travel-stained clothes with the blackest hair the old woman had ever seen. The young woman said, seize her, in a tone of casual command. The little men took her stick. She's stronger than even she looks, said one of them, his head still ringing from the blow she had got in with the stick before he had taken it. They walked her back into the round tower room. The fire, said the old woman, who had not talked to anyone who could answer her for six decades. Was anyone killed in the fire? Did you see the king or the queen? The young woman shrugged. I don't think so. The sleepers were, the sleepers we passed were all inside and the walls are thick. Who are you? Names, names. The old woman squinted then shook her head. She was herself and the name she had been born with had been eaten by time and lack of use. Where is this princess? The old woman just stared at her. And why are you awake? She said nothing. They spoke urgently to one another then, the little men and the queen. Is she a witch? There's a magic about her, but I do not think it's of her making. Guard her said the queen. If she is a witch, that stick might be important. Keep it from her. It's my stick, said the old woman. I think it was my father's, but he had no more use for it. The queen ignored her. She walked to the bed, pulled down the silk netting. The sleeper's face stared blindly up at them. So, this is where it began. This is where it began, said one of the little men. On her birthday, said another. Well, 
said the third. Somebody's got to do the honors. I shall, said the queen, gently. She lowered her face to the sleeping woman's. She touched the pink lips to her own carmine lips, and she kissed the sleeping girl long and hard. Did it work? asked a dwarf. I do not know, said the queen, but I feel for her, poor thing, sleeping her life away. You slept for a year in the same witch sleep, said the dwarf. You did not starve. You did not rot. The figure on the bed stirred as if she were having a bad dream from which she was fighting to wake herself. The queen ignored her. She had noticed something on the floor beside the bed. She reached down and picked it up. Now this, she said, this smells of magic. <clears throat> There's magic all through this, said the smallest dwarf. No, this, said the queen. She showed him the wooden spindle, the base half wound around with yarn. This smells of magic. It was here in this room, said the old woman suddenly, and I was little more than a girl. I had never gone so far before, but I climbed all the steps and I went up and up and round and round until I came to the topmost room. I saw that bed, the one you see, although there was nobody in it. There was only an old woman sitting on the stool, spinning wool into yarn with a spindle. I had never seen a spindle before. She asked if I would like a go. She took the wool in her hand and gave me the spindle to hold. She held my thumb and pressed it against the point of the spindle until blood flowed, and she touched the blood to the thread. And then she said, another voice interrupted her. A young voice it was, a girl's voice, but still sleep thicket. I said, now I take your sleep from you, girl, just as I take from you your ability to harm me in my sleep, for someone needs to be awake while I sleep. Your family, your friends, your world will sleep too. And then I lay down on the bed, and I slept, and they slept. And as each of them slept, I stole a little of their life, a little of their dreams. And as I slept, I took back my youth and my beauty and my power. I slept and I grew strong. I undid the ravages of time and I built myself a world of sleeping slaves. She was sitting up in the bed. She looked so beautiful and so very young. The queen looked at the girl and saw what she was searching for, the same look that she had seen in her stepmother's eyes, and she knew what manner of creature this girl was. We had been led to believe, said the tallest dwarf, that when you woke, the rest of the world would wake with you. Why would you ever think that? Asked the golden-haired girl, all childlike and innocent. Ah, but her eyes, her eyes were so old. I like them asleep. They are more biddable. She stopped for a moment, then she grinned. Even now, they come for you. I have called them here. It's a high tower, said the queen. 
and sleeping people do not move fast. We still have a little time to talk, your darkness. Who are you? Why would we talk? Why do you know to address me that way? The girl climbed off the bed and stretched deliciously, pushing each fingertip out before running her fingertips through her golden hair. She smiled, and it was as if the sun shone into that dim room. The little people will stop where they are now. I do not like them. And you, girl, you will sleep too. No, said the queen. She hefted the spindle. The yarn wrapped around it was black with age and with time. The dwarfs stopped where they stood, and they swayed and closed their eyes. The queen said, it's always the same with your kind. You need youth and you need beauty. You used, your, you used your own up so long ago, and now you find ever more complex ways of obtaining them, and you always want power. They were almost nose to nose now, and the fair-haired girl seemed so much younger than the queen. Why don't you just go to sleep? asked the girl, and she smiled guile guilelessly just as the queen's stepmother had smiled when she wanted something. There was a noise on the stairs far below them. I slept for a year in a glass coffin, said the queen, and the woman who put me there was much more powerful and dangerous than you will ever be. More powerful than I am, the girl seemed amused. <laughs> I have a million sleepers under my control. With every moment that I slept, I grew in power, and the circle of dreams grows faster and faster with every passing day. I have my youth, so much youth. I have my beauty. No weapon can harm me. Nobody alive is more powerful than I am. She stopped and stared at the queen. You are not of our blood, she said, but you have some of the skill. She smiled, the smile of an innocent girl who has woken on a spring morning. Ruling the world will not be easy, nor will maintaining order among those of the sisterhood who have survived into this degenerate age. I will need someone to be my eyes and ears to administer justice, to attend to things when I am otherwise engaged. I will stay at the center of the web. You will not rule with me, but beneath me. But you will still rule and rule continents, not just a tiny kingdom. She reached out a hand and stroked the queen's pale skin, which in the dim light of the room seemed almost as white as snow. The queen said nothing. Love me, said the girl. All will love me, and you who woke me, you must love me most of all. The queen felt something stirring in her heart. She remembered her stepmother then. Her stepmother had liked to be adored. Learning how to be strong, to feel her own emotions and not another's had been hard. But once you learned the trick of it, you did not forget, and she did not wish to rule continents. The girl smiled at her with eyes the color of the morning sky. The queen did not smile. She reached out her hand. Here, she said, this is not mine. She passed the spindle to the old woman beside her. The old woman hefted it thoughtfully. She began to unwrap the yarn from the spindle with arthritic fingers. This was my life, she said. This thread was my life. 
Mm. It was your life. You gave it to me, said the sleeper irritably. And it has gone on much too long. The tip of the spindle was still sharp after so many decades. The old woman, who had once been a princess, held the yarn tightly in her hand, and she thrust the point of the spindle into the golden-haired girl's breast. The girl watched as a trickle of red blood ran down her breast and stained her white dress crimson. No weapon can harm me, she said, and her girlish voice was petulant. Not anymore. Look, it's only a scratch. It's not a weapon, said the queen. It's your own magic, and a scratch is all that was needed. The girl's blood soaked into the thread that had once been wrapped about the spindle, the thread that ran from the spindle to the raw wool in the old woman's hand. The girl looked down at the blood staining her dress and at the blood on the thread, and she said only, it was just a prick of the skin, nothing more. She seemed confused. The noise on the stairs was getting louder, a slow, irregular shuffling as if a hundred sleepwalkers were coming up a stone spiral staircase with their eyes closed. The room was small, there was nowhere to hide, and the room's windows were too narrow, slits in the stones. The old woman, who had not slept in so many decades, said, You took my dreams. You took my sleep. Now that's enough of all that. She was a very old woman. Her fingers were gnarled like the roots of a hawthorn bush. Her nose was long and her eyelids drooped, but there was a look in her eyes in that moment that she was the look of someone young. She swayed and then she staggered and she would have fallen to the floor if the queen had not caught her first. The queen carried the old woman to the bed, marveling at how little she weighed, and placed her on the crimson counterpane. The old woman's chest rose and fell. The noise on the stairs was louder now. Then a silence, followed suddenly by a hubbub, as if a hundred people were talking at once, surprised and angry and confused. The beautiful, the beautiful girl said, but... And now there was nothing girlish or beautiful about her. Her face fell and became less shapely. She reached down to the smallest dwarf, pulled his hand axe from his belt. She fumbled with the axe, held it up threateningly, with hands all wrinkled and worn. The queen drew her sword. The blade's edge was notched and damaged from the thorns. But instead of striking, she took a step backwards. Listen, they are waking up, she said. They are all waking up. Tell me again about the youth you stole from them. Tell me again about your beauty and your power. Tell me again how clever you are, your darkness. When the people reached the tower room, they saw an old woman asleep on a bed, and they saw the queen standing tall, and beside her the dwarfs who were shaking their heads or scratching them. They saw something else on the floor also, a tumble of bones, a hank of hair as fine and as white as fresh spun cobwebs, a tracery of gray rags across it, and over all of it, an oily dust. Take care of her, said the queen, pointing with a dark wooden spindle at the old woman on the bed. She saved your lives. She left then with the dwarfs, 
none of the people in that room or on the steps dared to stop them or would ever understand what had happened. A mile or so from the castle, in a clearing in the forest of Acair, the queen and the dwarfs lit a fire of dry twigs, and in it they burned the thread and the fiber. The smallest dwarf chopped the spindle and fragments of black wood with his axe, and they burned them too. The wood chips gave off a noxious smoke as they burned, which made the queen cough, and the smell of old magic was heavy in the air. Afterwards, they buried the charred wooden fragments beneath a rowan tree. By evening, they were on the outskirts of the forest and had reached a cleared track. They could see a village across the hill and smoke rising from the village chimneys. So, so, said the dwarf with the brown beard, if we head due west, we can be at the mountains by the end of the week, and we'll have you back in your palace in Canislaire within ten days. Yes, said the queen, and your wedding will be late, but it will happen soon after you return, and the people will celebrate, and there will be joy unbounded through the kingdom. Yes, said the queen. She said nothing, but sat on the moss beneath an oak tree and tasted the stillness heartbeat by heartbeat. There are choices, she thought, when she had sat long enough. There are always choices. She made one. The queen began to walk, and the dwarfs followed her. You do know we're heading east, don't you? said one of the dwarfs. Oh, yes, said the queen. Well, that's all right, then, said the dwarf. They walked to the east, all four of them, away from the sunset and the lands they knew, and into the night. The end. Oh. From Neil Gaiman, Smoke and Mirrors, Chivalry. Yay. Mrs. Whitaker found the Holy Grail. It was under a fur coat. Every Thursday afternoon, Mrs. Whitaker walked down to the post office to collect her pension, even though her legs were no longer what they were. And on the way back home, she would stop in at the Oxfam shop and buy herself a little something. The Oxfam shop sold old clothes, knickknacks, oddments, bits and bobs, and large quantities of old paperbacks, all of them donations. Secondhand floatsome, often the house clearances of the dead. All the profits went to charity. The shop was staffed by volunteers. The volunteer on duty this afternoon was Marie, 17, slightly overweight, and dressed in a baggy mauve jumper that looked like she had bought it from the shop. Mary sat by the till with a copy of Modern Woman magazine, filling out a reveal your hidden personality questionnaire. Every now and then she'd flip to the back of the magazine and check the relative points assigned to an A, B, or C answer before making up her mind how she'd respond to the question. Mrs. Whitaker puttered around the shop. They still hadn't sold the stuffed cobra, she noted. It had been there for six months now, gathering dust, glass eyes gazing balefully at the clothes rack, 
and the cabinet filled with chipped porcelain and chewed toys. Mrs. Whitaker patted its head as she went past. She picked out a couple of Mills and Boone novels from a bookshelf, her thundering soul and her turbulent heart, a shilling each, and gave careful consideration to the empty bottle of Matthias Rosé with a decorative lampshade on it before deciding she really didn't have anywhere to put it. She moved a rather threadbare fur coat, which smelled badly of mothballs. Underneath it was a walking stick and a water-stained copy of Romance and Legend of Chivalry by A. R. Hope Moncrieff, priced at five pence. Next to the book, on its side, was the Holy Grail. It had a little round paper sticker on the base, and written on it in felt pen was the price 30p. Mrs. Whitaker picked up the dusty silver goblet and appraised it through her thick spectacles. This is nice, she called to Marie. Marie shrugged. It'll look nice on the mantelpiece. Marie shrugged again. Mrs. Whitaker gave 50 pence to Marie, who gave her 10 pence change and a brown paper bag to put the books and the Holy Grail in. Then she went next door to the butcher's and bought herself a nice piece of liver. Then she went home. The inside of the goblet was thickly coated with a brownish red dust. <laughs> Mrs. Whitaker washed it out with great care, then left it to soak for an hour in warm water with a dash of vinegar added. Then she polished it with metal polish until it gleamed and she put it on the mantelpiece in her parlor, where it sat between a small, soulful china basset hound and a photograph of her late husband, Henry, on the beach at Frinton in 1953. She had been right. It did look nice. For dinner that evening, she had the liver fried in bread crumbs with onions. It was very nice. The next morning was Friday. On alternate Fridays, Mrs. Whitaker and Mrs. Greenberg would visit each other. Today, it was Mrs. Greenberg's turn to visit Mrs. Whitaker. They sat in the parlor and ate macaroons and drank tea. Mrs. Whitaker took one sugar in her tea, but Mrs. Greenberg took sweetener, which she always carried in her handbag in a small plastic container. That's nice, said Mrs. Greenberg, pointing to the grail. What is it? It's the Holy Grail, said Mrs. Whitaker. It's the cup that Jesus drunk out of at the Last Supper. Later, at the crucifixion, it caught his precious blood when the centurion spear pierced his side. Mrs. Greenberg sniffed. She was small and Jewish and didn't hold with unsanitary things. <laughs> I wouldn't know about that, she said, but it's very nice. Our Myron got one just like that when he won the swimming tournament. <laughs> Only it's got his name on the side. <laughs> Is he still with that nice girl? The hairdresser? Bernice? Oh yes, they're thinking of getting engaged, said Mrs. Greenberg. That's nice, said Mrs. Whitaker. She took another macaroon. macaroon. Mrs. Greenberg baked her own macaroons and brought them over every alternate Friday, small, sweet, light brown biscuits with almonds on top. They talked about Myron, Myron and Bernice and Mrs. Whitaker's nephew, Ronald. She had no children and about their friend, Mrs. Perkins, who was in hospital with her hip. Poor dear. At midday, Mrs. Greenberg went home, and Mrs. Whitaker made herself cheese on toast for lunch. And after lunch, Mrs. Whitaker took her pills, the white and the red, and two little orange ones. The doorbell rang. Mrs. Whitaker answered the door. It was a young man with shoulder-length hair, 
so fair it was almost white, wearing gleaming silver armor with a white surcoat. Hello, he said. Hello, said Mrs. Whitaker. I'm on a quest, he said. That's nice, said Mrs. Whitaker noncommittally. Can I come in? he asked. Mrs. Whitaker shook her head. I'm sorry, I don't think so, she said. I'm on a quest for the Holy Grail, the young man said. Is it here? Have you got any identification? Mrs. Whitaker asked. She knew that it was unwise to let unidentified strangers into your home when you were elderly and living on your own. Handbags get empty, and worse than that. The young man went back down the garden path, his horse, a huge gray charger, big as a shire horse, its head high and its eyes intelligent, was tethered to Mrs. Whitaker's garden gate. The knight fumbled in the saddlebag and returned with a scroll. It was signed by Arthur, King of all Britons, and charged all persons of whatever rank or station to know that here was Galahad, Knight of the Table Round, and that he was on a right high and noble quest. There was a drawing of the young man below that. It wasn't a bad likeness. Mrs. Whitaker nodded. She had been expecting a little card with a photograph on it, but this was far more impressive. I suppose you had better come in, she said. They went into her kitchen. She made Galaad a cup of tea. Then she took him into the parlor. Galaad saw that the grail was on her mantelpiece and dropped to one knee. He put down the teacup carefully on the russet carpet. A shaft of light came through the net curtains and painted his odd face with golden sunlight and turned his hair into a silver halo. It is truly the Sangrail, he said very quietly. He blinked his pale blue eyes three times, very fast, as if he were blinking back tears. He lowered his head as if in silent prayer. Galad stood up again and turned to Mrs. Whitaker. Gracious lady, keeper of the Holy of Holies, let me now depart this place with the blessed chalice, that my journeyings may be ended and my gas fulfilled. My gash fulfilled. Sorry, said Mrs. Whitaker. Galad walked over to her and took her old hands in his. My quest is over, he told her. The Sangrail is finally within my reach. Mrs. Whitaker pursed her lips. Can you pick your teacup and saucer up, please? She said. Galad picked up his teacup apologetically. No, I don't think so said Mrs. Whitaker. I rather like it up there. It's just right between the dog and the photograph, my Henry. Is it gold you need? Is that it? Lady, I can bring you gold. No, said Mrs. Whitaker. I don't want any gold, thank you. I'm simply not interested. She ushered Galahad to the front door. Nice to meet you she said. His horse was leaning its head over her garden fence, nibbling her gladiola. Several of the neighborhood children were standing on the pavement watching it. Galad took some sugar lumps from the saddlebag and showed the braver of the children how to feed the horse, their hands held flat. The children giggled. One of the older girls stroked the horse's nose. Galad swung himself up onto the horse in one fluid movement. Then the horse and the knight trotted off down Hawthorne Crescent. Mrs. Whitaker watched them until they were out of sight, then sighed and went back inside. The weekend was quiet. On Saturday, 
Mrs. Whitaker took the bus into Marisfield to visit her nephew, Ronald, his wife, Euphonia, and their daughters, Clarissa and Dillian. She took them a currant cake she had baked herself. On Sunday morning, Mrs. Whitaker went to church. Her local church was St. James the Less, which was a little more, don't think of this as church, think of it as a place where like-minded friends can hang out and are joyful. Then Mrs. Whitaker felt entirely comfortable with, but she liked the vicar, the Reverend Bartholomew, when he wasn't actually playing the guitar. After the service, she thought about mentioning to him that she had the Holy Grail in her front parlor, but decided against it. On Monday morning, Mrs. Whitaker was working in the back garden. She had a small herb garden she was extremely proud of. Dill, vervain, mint, rosemary, thyme, and a wild expanse of parsley. She was down on her knees, wearing thick green gardening gloves, weeding and picking out slugs and putting them in a plastic bag. Mrs. Whitaker was very tender-hearted when it came to slugs. She would take them down to the back of her garden, which bordered on the railway line, and throw them over the fence. She cut some parsley for the salad. There was a cough behind her. Galad stood there, tall and beautiful, his armor glinting in the morning sun. In his arms, he held a long package wrapped in oiled leather. I'm back, he said. Hello, said Mrs. Whitaker. She stood up rather slowly and took off her gardening gloves. Well, she said, now you're here. You might as well make yourself useful. She gave him the plastic bag full of slugs and told him to tip the slugs out over the back fence. He did. Then they went into the kitchen. Tea or lemonade? She asked. Whatever you're having, Galahad said. Mrs. Whitaker took a jug of her homemade lemonade from the fridge and sent Galad outside to pick a sprig of mint. She selected two tall glasses. She washed the mint carefully and put a few leaves in each glass, then poured the lemonade. Is your horse outside? She asked. Oh, yes. His name is Grizzle. And you've come a long way, I suppose. A very long way. I see, said Mrs. Whitaker. She took a blue plastic basin from under the sink and half filled it with water. Galad took it out to Grizzle. <laughs> to Grizzle. He waited while the horse drank and brought the empty basin back to Mrs. Whitaker. Now, she said, I suppose you're still after the grail. I still do I seek the sangrail, he said. He picked up the leather package from the floor, put it down on her tablecloth, and unwrapped it. For it, I offer you this. It was a sword its blade almost four feet long. There were words and symbols traced elegantly along the length of the blade. The hilt was worked in silver and gold, and a large jewel was set in the pommel. It's very nice, said Mrs. Whitaker, doubtfully. This, said Galad, is a sword of Balmung, forged by Wayland Smith in the dawn times. Its twin is Flameburge, who wears it is unconquerable in war and invincible in battle. Who wears it is incapable of a cowardly act or an ignob ignoble one. Set in its pommel is the sardonyx birkone, which protects its possessor from poison slipped into wine or ale and from the treachery of friends. Mrs. Whitaker peered at the sword. It must be very sharp, she said after a while. It can slice a falling hair in twain. Nay, it could slice a sunbeam, said Galad proudly. Well then, maybe you ought to put it away, said Mrs. Whitaker. Don't you want it? 
Galad seemed disappointed. No, thank you, said Mrs. Whittaker. It occurred to her that her late husband, Henry, would have quite liked it. He would have hung it on the wall in his study next to the stuffed carp he had caught in Scotland and pointed it out to visitors. Galad rewrapped the oiled leather around the sword Balmung and tied it up with the white cord. He sat there, disconsolate. Mrs. Whittaker made, made him some cream cheese and cucumber sandwiches for the journey back and wrapped them in grease-proof paper. She gave him an apple for Griselle. He seemed very pleased with both gifts. She waved them both goodbye. That afternoon, she took the bus down to the hospital to see Mrs. Perkins, who was still in with her hip. Poor love. Mrs. Whitaker took her some homemade fruitcake, although she had left out the walnuts from the recipe because Mrs. Perkins' teeth weren't what they used to be. She watched a little television that evening and had an early night. On Tuesday, the postman called. Mrs. Whitaker was up in the bedroom at the top of the house, doing a spot of tidying and taking each step slowly and carefully. She didn't make it downstairs in time. The postman had left her a message which said that he'd tried to deliver a packet, but no one was home. Mrs. Whitaker sighed. She put the message into her handbag and went down to the post office. The package was from her niece, Sherelle, in Sydney, Australia. It contained photographs of her husband, Wallace, and her two daughters, Dixie and Violet, and a conch shell packed in cotton wool. Mrs. Whitaker had a number of ornamental shells in her bedroom. Her favorite had a view of the Bahamas done on it in enamel. It had been a gift from her sister, Ethel, who had died in 1983. She put the shell and the photographs in her shopping bag. Then, seeing that she was in the area, she stopped in at the Oxfam shop on her way home. Hello, Mrs. W, said Marie. Mrs. Whitaker stared at her. Marie was wearing lipstick, possibly not the best shade for her, nor particularly expertly applied, but, thought Miss Whitaker, that would come with time, and rather a smart skirt. It was a great improvement. Oh, hello, dear, said Mrs. Whitaker. There was a man in here last week asked about that thing you bought, the little metal cup thing. I told him where to find you. You don't mind, do you? No, dear, said Mrs. Whitaker. He found me. He was really dreamy, really, really dreamy, sighed Marie wistfully. I could have gone for him. <clears throat> and he had a big white horse and all, Marie concluded. She was standing up straighter as well. Mrs. Whitaker noted approvingly. On the bookshelf, Mrs. Whitaker found a new Mills and Boone novel, Her Majestic Passion. Although she hadn't yet finished the two she had bought on her last visit, she picked up the copy of Romance and Legend of Chivalry and opened it. It smelled musty. Ex Libris Fisher was neatly handwritten at the top of the first page in red ink. She put it down where she had found it. When she got home, Galad, Galad was waiting for her. He was giving the neighborhood children rides on Grizel's back up and down the street. I'm glad you're here, she said. I've got some cases that need moving. She showed him up to the box room in the top of the house. He moved all the old suitcases for her so she could get to the cupboard at the back. It was very dusty up there. She kept him up there most of the afternoon, moving things around while she dusted. Galad had a cut on his cheek, and he held one arm a little stiffly. They talked a little while while she dusted and tidied. Mrs. Whitaker told him about her late husband, Henry, and how the life insurance had paid the house off, and how she had all these things, but no one really to leave them to. 
no one but Ronald, really, and his wife only liked modern things. She told him how she had met Henry during the war when he was in the ARP, and she hadn't closed the kitchen blackout curtains all the way, and about the six penny dances they went to, they went to in the town, and how they'd gone to London when the war had ended, and she'd had her first drink of wine. Yeah, lad, told Mrs. Whitaker about his mother, Elaine, who was flighty and no better than she should have been, and something of a witch to boot, and his grandfather, King Pelles, who was well-meaning, although at best a little vague, and of his youth in the castle of Bliant on the joyous isle, and his father, whom he knew as Le Chevalier Malfet, who was more or less completely mad, and was in reality Lancelot du Lac, greatest of knights, in disguise, and bereft of his wits, and of Galahad's days as a young squire in Camelot. At five o'clock, Mrs. Whitaker surveyed the box room and decided that it met with her approval. Then she opened the window so the room could air, and they went downstairs to the kitchen where she put on the kettle. Galahad sat down at the kitchen table. He opened the leather purse at his waist and took out a round white stone. It was about the size of a cricket ball. My lady, he said, this is for you, and you give me the sand grail. Mrs. Whitaker picked up the stone, which was heavier than it looked, and held it up to the light. It was milkily translucent, and deep inside it flecks of silver glittered and glinted in the late afternoon sunlight. It was warm to the touch. Then, as she held it, a strange feeling crept over her. Deep inside, she felt stillness and a sort of peace. Serenity, that was the word for it. She felt serene. Reluctantly, she put the stone back on the table. It's very nice, she said. That is the philosopher's stone which our forefather Noah hung in the ark to give light when there was no light. It can transform base metals into gold, and it has certain other properties, Galad told her proudly. And that isn't all. There's more here. From the leather bag, he took an egg and handed it to her. It was the size of a goose egg and was a shiny black color, mottled with scarlet and white. When Mrs. Whitaker touched it, the hairs on the back of her neck prickled. Her immediate impression was one of incredible heat and freedom. She heard the crackling of distant fires, and for a fraction of a second, she seemed to feel herself far above the world, swooping and diving on wings of flame. She put the egg down on the table next to the philosopher's stone. That is the egg of the phoenix, said Galahad. From far Araby it comes. One day it will hatch out into the phoenix bird itself. And when its time comes, the bird will build a nest of flame, lay its egg and die to be reborn in flame in a later age of the world. I thought that's what it was, said Mrs. Whitaker. And last of all, lady, said Galahad, I have brought you this. He drew it from his pouch and gave it to her. It was an apple, apparently carved from a single ruby on an amber stem. A little nervously, she picked it up. It was soft to the touch, deceptively so. Her fingers bruised it, and ruby-colored juice from the apple ran down Mrs. Whitaker's hand. The kitchen filled almost imperceptibly, magically, with the smell of summer fruit, of raspberries and peaches and strawberries and red currants, as if from a great way away she heard distant voices raised in song and far music on the air. It is one of the apples of the Hesperides, said Galahad quietly. One bite from it will heal any illness or wound, no matter how deep. 
a second bite restores youth and beauty, and a third bite is said to grant eternal life. Mrs. Whittaker licked the sticky juice from her hand. It tasted like fine wine. There was a moment then when it all came back to her, how it was to be young, to have a firm, slim body that would do whatever she wanted it to do, to run down a country lane for the simple, unladylike joy of running, to have men smile at her just because she was herself, and happy about it. She caught her breath. Mrs. Whittaker looked at Sir Galad, most comely of all knights, sitting fair and noble in her small kitchen. And that's all I have brought for you, said Galad. They weren't easy to get either. Mrs. Whittaker put the ruby fruit down on her kitchen table. She looked at the philosopher's stone and the egg of the phoenix and the apple of life. Then she walked into her parlor and looked at the mantelpiece, at the little china basset hound and the holy grail and the photograph of her late husband, Henry, shirtless, smiling, and eating an ice cream in black and white almost 40 years ago. She went back into the kitchen the kettle had begun to whistle. She poured a little steaming water into the teapot, swirled it around and poured it out. Then she added two spoonfuls of tea and one for the pot and poured in the rest of the water. All this she did in silence. She turned to Galahad then and she looked at him. Put that apple away, she told Galahad firmly. You shouldn't offer things like that to old ladies. It isn't proper. She paused then. But I'll take the other two. She continued after a moment's thought. They'll look nice on the mantelpiece. And two for one's fair, and I, or I don't know what is. Galad beamed. He put the ruby apple into his leather pouch. Then he went down on one knee and kissed Mrs. Whitaker's hand. Stop that. <laughs> said Mrs. Whittaker. She poured them both cups of tea after getting out the very best china, which was only for special occasions. They sat in silence drinking their tea. When they had finished their tea, they went into the, into the parlor. Galad crossed himself and picked up the grail. Mrs. Whittaker arranged the egg and the stone where the grail had been. The egg kept tipping kept tipping on one side, and she propped it up against the little china dog. They do look very nice, said Mrs. Whittaker. Yes, agreed Galahad. They look very nice. Can I give you anything to eat before you go back? She asked. He shook his head. Some fruit cake, she said. You may not think you want any now, but you'll be glad of it in a few hours' time and you should probably use the facilities. Now give me that and I'll wrap it up for you. She directed him to the small toilet at the end of the hall and went into the kitchen holding the grail. She had some old Christmas wrapping paper in the pantry and she wrapped the grail in it and tied the package with twine. Then she cut a large slice of fruitcake and put it in a brown paper bag along with a banana and a slice of processed cheese in silver foil. Galahad came back from the toilet. She gave him the paper bag and the holy grail. Then she went up on tiptoes and kissed him on the cheek. You're a nice boy, she said. You take care of yourself. He hugged her and she shooed him out of the kitchen and out of the back door and she shut the door behind him. She poured herself another cup of tea and cried quietly into a Kleenex while the sound of hoofbeats echoed down Hawthorne Crescent. On Wednesday, Mrs. Whitaker stayed in all day. On Thursday, she went down to the post office to collect her pension. Then she stopped in at the Oxfam shop. The woman on the till was new to her. Where's Mary? Where's Marie? asked Mrs. Whitaker. The woman on the till 
who had blue rinsed gray hair and blue spectacles that went up into diamante points, shook her head and shrugged her shoulders. She went off with a young man, she said, on a horse. I ask you, I meant to be down in the Heathfield shop this afternoon. I had to get my Johnny to run me up here while we find someone else. Oh, said Mrs. Whitaker. Well, it's nice that she found herself a young man. Nice for her, maybe, said the lady on the till. But some of us were meant to be in Heathfield this afternoon. On a shelf near the back of the shop, Mrs. Whitaker found a tarnished old silver container with a long spout. It had been priced at 60 pence, according to the little paper label stuck to the side. It looked a little like a flattened, elongated teapot. She picked out a Mills and Boone novel she hadn't read before. It was called Her Singular Love. She took the book and the silver container up to the woman on the till. 65p, dear, said the woman, picking up the silver object, staring at it. Funny old thing, isn't it? Came in this morning. It had writing carved along the side in blocky old Chinese characters and an elegant arching handle. Some kind of oil can, I suppose. No, it's not an oil can, said Mrs. Whitaker, who knew exactly what it was. It's a lamp. There was a small metal finger ring, unornamented, tied to the handle of the lamp with brown twine. Actually, said Mrs. Whitaker, on second thoughts, I think I'll just have the book. She paid her five pence for the novel and put the lamp back where she found it, in the back of the shop. After all, Mrs. Whitaker reflected as she walked home. It wasn't as if she had anywhere to put it.